Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Fully Automated Targeted SNP Genotyping for Plant and Animal Applications. I'm Michelle Ashton of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroot and sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. For more information on our sponsor, please visit Beckman.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our speakers, Jürgen Zimmerman, the Senior Engineer of Automation at the Genomics Core Facility at EMBL, and Bjorn Textor, the Senior Application Specialist at New England Biolabs. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Jürgen and Bjorn, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Michelle, for this kind introduction and welcome everybody to today's webinar. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Beckman Kuta Life Sciences and Lab Roots for organizing this event. And Jürgen and I are very happy to give you an introduction about the NEB Next uh, Direct uh, Genotyping Solution, a novel technology for targeted genotyping that we were using in conjunction together with the Biomac i7 workstation from Beckman Kuter to generate a fully automated targeted SNP genotyping um, approach for plant and animal applications. During the webinar, we'll provide you with several information uh, on the NEB Next Direct Genotyping Solution, as this, as this is a very new technology, we would kind of, like to introduce you into how where does it fit, how does it work, and then also looking into manual data, how robust is it, and then finally bring this into the automation context, content, um, how this works on the Biomac i7 workstation. Let's get started. What does, how does it fit? Where does it fit? When we're looking uh, generally onto genotyping applications, uh, this can span a huge variety of areas, down from agricultural biology, where you're thinking about genotyping, genomic selection, marker-assisted breeding, QTL mapping, or QC applications, all the way to translational research, where you can envision it in population screenings, GVAS, or model organism screening, in marker discovery, down to clinical applications where you're looking at polymorphic risk scores, diagnostics, clinical trials, um, or sample tracking. At this point, the NEB Next Direct Genotyping Solution is developed for agriculture or animal applications, uh, assisting breeding and uh, livestock um, applications. When we think about all these different applications, we also think about different options how to perform the, the genotyping. So we tend to think about this in two axes. On one of the axes, on the horizontal one, we do have the number of samples that we can process through a given laboratory, and this is a function of complexity of these workflows as well as the costs that uh, they are associated with. When we think about the number of markers on the other axis, we think about this relatively how many genotyping we can perform in parallel. So in this figure, we attempted to place those um, the technologies into various buckets to showcase where they fit into the greater strategy. Things such as Sanger sequencing that might be good for relatively low throughput processing in terms of number of samples and relatively low numbers of markers will, for example, endpoint PCR, where we really look at low numbers of markers but can extend uh, that due to the low cost over tens of thousands of samples. At the other end of this spectrum, we do have different sequencing technologies as well as microarrays, where you can look at a very high number of markers uh, to be genotyped, but the cost of some of these workflows 
might it make it a little bit difficult to apply these technologies to a very high number of samples. In the middle of this, we do have targeted uh, next generation sequencing, which I think occupies sort of a niche in terms of being able to look at a relatively high number of markers. And by reducing the cost of sequencing, you can actually apply this to more samples. And the various considerations one might put into place when you are determining which technology, uh, technology you can use for different applications, take account uh, various considerations, such as sample numbers and marker numbers. You, you want to look at cost per data point, um, the current uh, flexibility uh, of the technology. So can you change anything once your panel is designed? Um, scalability. Also very interesting is the ability to gain contextual genomic information around your marker. And then uh, finally, also the ability to, uh, besides um, SMPs, also detect insertions and deletions. So with the NBNX direct geotyping solution, we really wanted to generate a target enrichment NGS approach to reduce the cost per assay by being able to use more samples per sequencing run plus expanding the capability of targeted NGS out into the tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of samples. So looking at the NEBNX direct geotyping solution workflow from a high level, we can discriminate between a minimum number of samples that can be processed up to a very high number of samples that can be processed. To do so, we are using the same protocol, but uh, using different uh, strategies of uh, pre-pool plexing, as well as sample pool plexing, um, to obtain um, the different throughputs. So in this case here, you see the minimum input of samples into a process, where we are processing up to 96 samples uh, into a one library um, prep process, and this goes then into one sequencing reaction on an Illumina sequencing instrument, which then generates uh, up to 96 data sets. As a maximum for throughput capabilities, we can use 24 or up to 24 384 well plates and pull all these samples into a um, 96 uh, library preps, so into a single 96 well plate, which then goes um, consequently onto the sequencer and generates uh, over 9,200 data sets in one sequencing run. The goal of the NBNext direct genotyping solution project was to reduce costs and streamline workflows through pre-capture pooling of up to 96 samples, to minimize sequencing efficiency through dual barcoding sample indexing plus unique molecular identifier, increasing target coverage and uniformity through unique capture-based enrichments, to animate marker uh, dropouts um, with finely uh, tuned uh, bait design, and increasing sample throughput using a one-day protocol, which already uh, from the development had automation in mind. And we go all to these details uh, in a minute. So how does the NBNext direct genotyping solution work? When we are looking at the direct genotyping solution workflow, we discriminate between two parts of the workflow. The first part of the workflow is um, the sample barcoding and the pooling strategy. So at this step, we are um, processing each sample individually and then putting this into a pool uh, with finally downstream um, moving it through denaturation, hybridization for target enrichment, so the region of interest, and then building a library. So from the target enrichment step, we are talking about a pooled um, sample or, or pool which contain up to 96 samples in one pool. And how this works, uh, I will show you in a minute. To really understand the um, barcoding strategy of the genotyping solution, I'll put here uh, this slide. So what we, um, throughout the process, what we generate is a library that on the one, on the on one side, we have a sample index that tells you in which well of the 96 well plate the sample was located. And then we have an additional hybridization or as we call pool index which tells you in which pool or in which 96 well plate the sample was located. So in the combination of sample index and hybridization slash pool index, we have a capacity of 9,260 combination, 
which can go uh, onto an Illumina sequencer. When we're looking into the details of the workflow, it all starts with a genomic DNA that is isolated from the crop or the species of interest. So the unsheared DNA goes first uh, into an enzymatic-based fragmentation um, that also concludes with end repair, five-time phosphorylation, as well as the A-tailing. For the genotyping solution, we need input material from 10 to 100 nanogram of DNA for each individual sample. Um, and I would like to point out in terms of uh, plants, this can also vary to be determined by the size uh, of the genome of the crop. After the fragmentation and end repair, uh, we are moving right away into the uh, ligation of the first uh, adapter. We are ligating here a five prime custom adapter that carries an eight base pair sample index as well as a 12 base pair unique molecular identifier. Once uh, all the samples are tagged with this adapter, uh, each individual sample carries a sample index, which allows them then to subsequently pooling of up to 96 samples um, into one pool. Finally, to reduce uh, the, uh, uh, the, the amount of volume that we have in this pool, we are concentrating this pool down to 60 microliters using magnetic beads. At this point, we have a pool and all steps downstream are then processed not on a single individual sample base, but on the pool that contains up to 96 samples, which allows to save costs in terms of plastics but also reduces dramatically hands on time. Once we generated the pool, we are moving then directly into the target enrichment process, where we denaturate and then hybridize uh, the samples to balance related baits. The baits are targeting both strands of the DNA and can target up to 5,000 markets per sample. The baits are placed uh, with a 75 nucleotide proximity to the target of it, to the marker of interest. The whole uh, hybridization time uh, for this um, part of the workflow takes 90 minutes. After the hybridization of the base, we are then removing by enzymatic by an enzymatic step the three prime of the three prime region of the of the base to reduce off-target uh, effects um, and get more stringent um, sequences uh, at the end. But using magnetic step dividend beads. Um, we are doing a couple of wash series to get rid of all the uh, unwanted uh, DNA sequences. After removing of the three prime off target region and generating a blunt end, we are then adding the second adapter, the three prime adapter, and which then subsequently is followed by a final PCR where we are then building the final library and integrating the pool index on the on the one side of the of the library. Again, with a combination of the sample index and the pool index, we can pool up to 9,260 samples into a, a single sequencing run. Just as a reminder here, um, the directed geno genotyping solution uh, workflow contains a single uh, individual um, process um, step, uh, sample step, and then a pool sample step and it's really designed for automation and also only takes one day uh, to finish the library. Besides of all these, uh, we also streamlined the um, sequencing uh, reaction um, on the Illumina sequencing platform. So to, to get data out of this, we uh, need a read one uh, where we have 20 cycles uh, on the sequencer to read the 12 base per UMI as well as the eight base per sample index followed by uh, read two, where we have at least 75 bases that is reading into the, into the region of interest to identify the target. Um, and this uh, adds all together to a number of 95 total cycles for a single minus six uh, pool of samples. In addition, if you have more than one pool, you uh, have the flexibility also to read uh, in the I7 index another eight uh, bases of the pool index so that ends up with a total number of 103 cycles to um, sequence a multiple 96 uh, plex pools of samples. All of this uh, leads 
to a 10 to 12 hour sequencing run on a MySeq and uh, also keep in mind that the, uh, the wet lab process to generate the libraries takes approximately a day. Uh, you, can, um, you can get from samples to data within 24 hours. So how robust uh, is the technology? As I said, the uh, NEBNX direct genotyping solution can be applied to various uh, applications. Um, as you can, uh, as you remember, uh, from the beginning, there are plant applications, animal applications, but also human applications. Um, we started off with uh, developing this technology with a partner here in Europe um, to, um, to um, develop it for marker-assisted selection and breeding, also quantitative trait local screening, and now expanding um, also into animal and human applications uh, such as NGF sample tracking. Today, um, as said, we will be focusing on the, the plant applications. To really test the um, performance of the technology, we generated uh, three different uh, sets of panels uh, for tornado, maize, and rice, where we are using publicly available um, slip content from the, um, from the SOCAP project for tornado, but also from the Panzea project for mice and uh, the Generation Challenge program for rice to generate some data that are not of uh, proprietary information. So most of the people using the uh, genotyping solution so far are working with custom panels that uh, contain uh, 100 to 5,000 proprietary SNPs. And we are very happy to discuss all the projects together with you. Here we are now presenting data uh, on the uh, 2,300 SNP panel um, uh, from the um, SOCAT project. What you can see here is uh, a single sample uh, that uh, shows you uh, the uh, coverage uh, of all the 2,300 markers that are in this SOCAT panel. Um, and what you can see here is that we um, generate a very nice uniform panel um, and even distribution um, of reads over these different markers. This is something that we are very proud of and achieved this by, um, um, by generating um, the, these uh, dates individually uh, at NEB. So meaning we are synthesizing individually and then generating an XE model pool and then sequencing actually the, 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 um, the, the, the panel and then determining, determining over and under representative regions. So for the overrepresentative regions, um, we are then uh, decreasing the concentration of the molarity of the base, whereas for the underrepresented regions, we are adding additional days to have the best uniform coverage as possible um, so that you have not to spend too many sequencing reads to, um, to monitor all your markers of interest. Interestingly, uh, we are also storing uh, all the days um, individually so that there, are, or there is also the ability to change content very easily over time rather than starting to produce a new panel from scratch. Looking then at how this performs over the, over the different samples, in this case here, you do see 96 samples and each sample contains uh, 2,300 markers of the SOCAP tomato panel. And what we show here that uh, we are able by the pooling strategy uh, to distribute uh, equally well uh, the, the filter read to each sample, which contains between 250,000 and 300,000 reads. For so capture efficiency, again, uh, what you see here is again the 96 samples, each sample again 2,300 markers and the specificity is not dropping uh, between the individual samples. So each sample is uh, working equally well, and um, um, it's uh, the, really the goal is to have more efficient uh, use uh, of the sequencing data. Finally, when we're looking at the mean target coverage, also in this case, we, we, can, uh, we see that we have a very nice um, even distribution over these 96 samples with each 2,300 individual markers. A nice um, way to use the technology is also to use it uh, for different parts of breeding processes. So you could envision that there are also 
requirements that you're just using a sub pool of uh, the, the main pool that you're working with. So what you can see here, we were um, building out a 500 market panel and a 96 market panel out of the 2,300 uh, total market panel. And what the IGB plot shows you that there's an e equal um, coverage across the subsets that enables you also uh, to use a different sub pools that have um, and provides you with flexibility um, over these different market sets. So far, the NEB Next Direct genotyping solution has been used for different types of crops, um, from sunflowers to rapeseed, but also including uh, some of the ornamentals already. And I just want to remind you, if uh, something like this is interesting for you, um, the requirements to generate such a custom panel for you is uh, not much. We only need a partial reference genome or amplicon sequence with at least a 75 nucleotide a flanking region. Um, for other um, um, species um, or even human coordinates of targets uh, could be used. And then we are using also, we, we would require a DNA sample of your origin. So what we do is here is we really partnering together um, to really have uh, the design and the, the production of these panels according to your needs um, and also your specific DNA isolation. But once you receive the pool, you can directly move forward with the production and using the technology. With this, I would like to end and I'm happy to hand over to you. Thank you, Björn. First, I'd like to give credit to the people we had the pleasure to work together on this automation project. So actually, it's Martin Giener from Beckmann. And I'd like to thank especially for his endurance, taking our feedback and optimizing his program. Uh, then Michael Petridis from NEB Biolabs and his patients checking what the machine is doing and his valuable feedback for optimizing the biochemical protocols and Susan from Directed Genomics for her very fast response, her analysis, and her general support. Actually, now i like to summarize just the goals we have with this automation project. Uh, the first important thing for us is always a full walkway automation, and this has several reasons. The first one, we are a core facility, and we like to utilize the resources we have optimally, which means we like to operate during the night and utilize the machines as long as possible. Uh, the other point, of course, is that if you like to wish to scale out for higher throughput, you need interfaces. And this makes only sense if there's no human interference necessary. If you're thinking of lever feeders, and if you'd like to go to ultra high throughput with acoustic dispensers or anything like that, you have to move out of the machine and there shouldn't be no need to go to the system again. Of course, data quality should be at least equivalent to the manual processing. And there we took the benchmark from NEB and from the lab people there. Then, of course, we are actually targeting on process stability. So which means we need in-plate homogeneity of results and plate-to-plate -plate results shouldn't vary. Uh, system robustness is very crucial because if you are testing it only in a defined lab environment, uh, then most of the systems and protocols are confronted with real life, which means tolerating variability and tolerances in plastic materials and also the input material, which means the DNA material, is, it's not always stable. So protocols may vary. Actually, the development status of the plants may vary a little bit. And uh, so you have to cope with these situations. Um, the other point is we developed a prototype in a way. So actually, we are looking already for scalability, which means from a small number of samples, we like to go already to a higher sample set. So actually, already by software, we allow a great flexibility from this mid-range processing capabilities to high throughput capabilities. I go to this point a little bit later again, 
and make reference all the time where we see the potential and actually where we have integrated already the options, which makes it possible uh, to increase throughput. Then cost effectiveness is very crucial. If, if you may consider that you are going to throughput or ultra high throughput, uh, then each cent or fraction of a cent is counting at the end to your final bill. And this is related to plastics, all different kinds of plastics, and of course the biochemical consumption, which means the stuff you are using during pipetting, the dead volumes in your reservoirs, for example. And last but not least, it's about sample tracking, because you shouldn't lose overview about the samples you are processing. And as the system is bringing already some capabilities with it, uh, it's quite supportive in the development process and in later on operations. At first, I'd like uh, to have a short glimpse on, on the process itself. So here it's already uh, scaled for Biomech i7 with uh, 96 well heads. So if, if you look at the process, you can divide it in two parts. In the beginning, you are still dealing with individual samples. And at a certain stage, you start pooling it, and then you're only operating with pools of 96, for example. And the time we have put below, so this 480 minutes for a complete set of 96 is real time. Most of the times are following really to the incubation times, which are mentioned in the protocol, and some time for pipetting. As we are optimizing the whole protocol, it's not scaling too much, which increasing throughput. The only thing which is definitely scaling at that point if we are pooling, because then we have to operate with single tip operation, and there we're just running in the limit. So there is no potential to scale up further at that point. If you like to scale up just from this single 96 well operation, it's quite straightforward with the basic system which I will introduce later, just by multiplying or repeating the first part of this uh, single sample processing four times, and then continuing just with the number of pools. But there's a more easy way for doing this. I'm coming to that point later. Uh, now I'd like to show you the i7. Actually, we decided to go with the i7, and this has several reasons. First is, okay, we had some experience with Biomec F FXP and were quite satisfied. But the whole design offered some capabilities which actually really makes it a very good option for this process. First point is we have two arms which can handle, which can be configured in two different options. So we went for a Ben 8 configuration on one and a 96 well hand on, on the other arm. So for hit picking, master mix distribution, which we are doing during the incubation time, so we are not losing any any times, and the 96 well head just processing samples in, in parallel. Now it's also the very favorite option. We can switch between 96 well head and 384 well head. So if you're considering scale, scaling out, you just can switch ahead and put a 384 wall head in there, and then you are multiplying just by a factor of four. Uh, you may also adjust another component on, on the system I will show you, show you later. So the other point is, which is quite neat with this in instrument, are these two independent grippers mounting on these two arms. So at the end, this combination of two heads which can move independently and two grippers which can move independently allows a certain type of multitasking. So the system is doing on its own already on some scheduling and try to intercept and also to uh, move different processes and subparts into each other and optimize the whole throughput up to a certain extent. The whole system also offers in our configuration an integrated PCR system. So no samples have to move to be moved out of the deck at all during the processing time. Multiple CPAC components or Peltier elements allow the storage of master mixes at four degrees and the samples at four degrees are actually pre-incubation steps. 
What I like to mention here is a system which is called DART. And actually, I just like to introduce it a little bit because I don't know whether we have too much time for questions at, at the end. DART is a system which is embedded into the Biomac operation system, which allows tracking of samples. So at the point when a sample plate or a set of samples is introduced to the system, you can query it via SQL statement from your LIMP system, or you can query it from uh, an Excel sheet or what, whatsoever. And then you can bind this data type for the individual samples together with a plate ID, which is preferably coming from a barcode reader, which we have also built in on, on the system. And from that time on, the sample information is bound to this plate during the whole process until the end, when it starts in the uh, cooled PCR position uh, that it can be stored overnight. The advantage of this is not only that is this is it allowing tracking during the whole process, but you can bound additional information to it, which means quality values at the end. And with the plate ID, it's very clear that the next process is already predefined. So as an example, as we have produced already a library during the process and somebody placed this plate again on the machine, the biomech would be quite reluctant to process it further on because it's very clear the system knows it's already pre-processed, so please don't select this protocol again. So it's a very potential system which is integrated. So the last but not least option is we have implemented already several NEB protocols on the system, and we know about the performance. So several DNA protocols, uh, the whole portfolio of RNA protocols from NEB is running, and it's capable to process single cell application, which is quite important to us. And it's not only running NEB protocols, but we can run SmartSeq and other ones where we get the information out of it. So let's come to the basic deck layout, how the system looks like at EMBL. So there are these passive positions, which are here in gray, which are named TLs or P positions, which are passive, which means you can place Plates on it, tips on it, that's it. Then we have a position which is called TR2. This is just a waste container to get rid of stuff which is used on the system. And then we have active positions, which is an orbital shaker, which we need for beat purification, which actually ease it up for mixing. Then we have several Peltier positions, as I mentioned before, in our case it's three. Then we have an active wash, wash station, to prevent tip exchange at each step. And then we have positions which are called LF. LF and TR1 are just lab wear feeder. And now we're coming to another option to scale it up. This LF positions allows the storage of more than 15 tip boxes in a cassette and more than 20 microtator plates of different types. So in principle, we are also able to feed up additional disposable material plastics from the side. Together with the extension of, of the head, we will gain then another level of throughput on that system. But coming back to this basic configuration I'd like to show you. Um, here we see on the right side, we see tips, which are exclusively for the span 8 component. Then we have a cooled position for the master mixes. Then we have master mix position for those mixes which need to be cooled. Then we have a magnet here for separation. We have certain lids in there, larger reservoirs, and some tips over here, which are used for the 96 well heads. Oop. Sorry. Then this is the software in interface, which is actually drastically reduced just to the need of a user uh, with not too many options on it. So the only thing at the top level is that you can select the general procedures, which mean you can select uh, for single step, whether you like to move the, uh, to the complete process, processing the library until it can be run uh, on the sequencer at the end, or you can select individual options. And this is quite helpful if you get samples which are coming from, from another system. If they're manual samples, you like to intercept in there. 
at a position and there you can continue with this option. So you are selecting the number of samples. You can decide your, in how many pools you like to do it. Uh, and this is uh, off deck cycler. This is not an option we, we prefer and we wouldn't advise, but some people just like, like to have it. So it's a general policy to have it in there. So when the deck is filled with plastics and you have decided which option you like to run. Then you get a printout in case of a PDF. So you can also start, you can feed it in your database and, and your limb system as, as you wish, which is actually showing up the results from the guided lab fair setup. So you see um, the layout of the deck where you should place your tip boxes, your plates and all the material. Then you get a position of the uh, master mixes if they are in a block like here and they are differently colored for the different type of solutions you have to place there and in the middle you have a section where you actually see the recipes for the master mixes. We decided against the pre-dispense and the automatically set up of master mix for one reason and this is cost effectiveness again. Uh, there are systems where you can do this automatically. And in principle, you can set it up also on, on the i7 here. But even if you spin down from the master mix boxes, it's not as efficient to move all the chemicals out of the kits you get from the companies. NEB is quite generous and they call their kits even automation friendly. And obviously there are because there's a certain surplus in there, which makes it easier. But if you like to use a kit partially once and run it again, and if you have automatic setup of master mixes, then you're losing too much material. And so that's the reason why we are going that way. And actually the people that are that like this type of organization with that printout, they can go to the lab and see immediately whether they have to go to the cold room and get new chemicals or whether they can just take your local freezer and get the material out of there. Actually, I mentioned in the first slide that actually cost effectiveness is one of the crucial points. And I mentioned that in the setup of the master mixes, we try to minimize and of course in the techniques, in the pipetting, in the optimization of, of the program, we minimize as much as possible. But also for plastic materials, we are considering different options, how to pipe it, where it's possible reusing, how to optimize the steps. At the end, we made uh, this table with required plastic consumables. And actually on the left side, we made in gray the settings for pre-pooling process and the other one for the post-pool process. Uh, on top, you see we did it once for 96 samples and one for 384 volt samples. And you can immediately see that actually during the individual sample process, you have when we switch from 96 to 304, it's actually multiplying by the factor of four as expected. But if we are in the pre-dispense phase, master mix setting up and all this stuff, it's not growing linear but only marginally. And in the level of pooling, then even the number of increasing is even slower. At that point, it's very, very nicely, actually, as Bjorn mentioned in the beginning, to minimize costs on the chemical side, working with pools, concentrating the stuff. We really can mirror this attempt also here during the automation process and optimizing it. Björn mentioned several uh, panels which are already available from NEB. So for tomato, maize, and rice. And we decided for this test project for the soil cap. So this is the result from the first 96 samples in one pool from the Biomec i7. Uh, what is quite neat in there, we have a very deep beginning of the library, which is optimizing the sequencing results as it's really diminishing useless empty sequence information. The yield is also quite high with 1.5 microgram and the background is 
really low. So it's optimal entry point for sequencing. Uh, this is the setup we used for uh, the sequencing on the Illumina instrument. So we're taking paired end 150 basis sequencing kit. We read uh, the R1 with 20 bases, and we read from the other side with R2 with 85 bases. Actually, uh, the pool index we don't need in the setup for for this testing. If you're going with 384 well, then of course we need the pool information. Yep. Uh, these are the results from the Illumina sequencer itself. So the values which we're taking as optimal, so above Q30 is 97%, so as we would expect it. Uh, the other point is uh, they're always nicely high aligned, so no diminishing during the whole number of cycles. This is the normal base distribution. In the beginning of the read, you see this fluctuation. At the end, it's quite stable. I think what's then more telling is then at the end the results from the bioinformatical analysis. So at first we are interested in past filter reads. Everything is above 150,000 reads, so everything is quite neat. Then we are looking for coverage, and uh, everything is above 50, so substantially above it. And actually, we get a green light from direct genomics that actually they're quite happy with these results. Then we are looking for the general sequencing matrix, and there we see again mapping on target is about 94%, quite equally about all of the samples, and uniformity is above 97.5%. And that's all what we like to see at that point. I like to summarize our presentation the following way. We could show that we achieve a complete walk away automation process of the net next genotyping solution on the Biomac i7. We show that we can scale from 96 even to 384, maybe more. We minimize the use of consumable with respect to chemistry and also plastic consumables. We produce the data which are equivalent to the data which can be achieved by a manual operator. And we can at the end even show that this prototype is able to be the basis for ultra high throughput processing in this genotyping field. And I think this is very crucial for the future. I'd like to invite you just with the last statement and saying, if you like to see the instrument live, and if you like to have uh, more information how we are doing the things, you are kindly invited to visit us at EMBL. The project wouldn't be possible with this large number of people from all our company partners. And I think it was not only successful, but it was also a really nice and pleasant collaboration. Thank you very much. Time for questions. Thank you, Jürgen and Bjorn, for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, our first question is, are you able to derive information on the region surrounding the marker for discovery of haplotyping purposes? I will uh, answer this uh, question, uh, Michel. Um, yes, uh, is the answer. Uh, using the technology, the sequencing data provides information within 75 base pairs on either side of the targeted marker. So these data can be used for SNP discovery efforts, but also uh, can be used for haplotyping of sets of markers within the known proximity. Great, thank you. Have you tested the technology on plant DNA derived extracted using different protocols? That is also correct. Uh, the NEBNX direct genotyping solution has been tested on DNA extracted uh, using also, for example, ZTAP buffer, uh, as well as column purified DNA. The enrichment technology produces similar results 
across these different um, um, extraction methods. Now, is there any data from the technology available to analyze? Uh, this is uh, also possible. Um, so we have a generated data set for our tomato, maize, and rice panels that uh, are available for downloading from a secure site. Uh, so in this case, please reach out to Neon and Bar Labs uh, to get access to these uh, panel data. Okay, now this audience member wants to know what is a DART? DART, as I introduce it a little, uh, a little bit during my presentation, is a system which is actually doing sample tracking. So actually it's somehow a little limb system which is dealing with sample information. So it can map it if the samples are coming on the system. So then you can also feed the information of the sample into it, which means the volume, whether it's a sample which has to be processed into a specific manner, so concentration. So you can have uh, concentration adaptions if necessary, and you can bind all the additional information which are gathered during the process to it. So when has it been processed? So if you have to document the whole thing in a GMP man manner, then you get all the information out of it, together with the information, the protocol, versioning of the protocol, who has started the protocol, when was it finished, is there any delay, worked or something wrong, and you can bind it together with external data. So you have interfaces with SQL and LIM system, and this makes it really, really powerful. Actually, we like it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. So this question says, why did you choose a Biomec i7? <laughs> um, I don't know whether I like like to say this as it, as it is a sponsored event, but uh, we are scientifically driven and in, independently. And uh, it's a design which is, let's call it like a tank. So depending on all the comparisons we have made to other providers, it's a stable system. It, it compete, it can deal with so many exceptions which you can feed into the system and it's tolerating a lot of external events like I mentioned, so plastic tolerances and all the things. We haven't seen this with other providers in a way. Then it's endurance, so we are operating the comparable systems already for quite a while. And uh, the other point is it's also related a little bit to the company itself, and which means it's the support, it's the availability during development phase, and it's uh, also support afterwards. Uh, uh, and we see the development of, of the last over the last years, which are actually resulting in the i7, which makes it a quite mature product. That's to the history of the instrument. And the other is it has a very large stack and the flexibility to introduce other components, to have interfaces and to have space to extend it to other systems. I think these are the main key components which drive our decision. Great, thank you. Okay, and our last question is, how about scalability to UHT? With the i7v prototype, the application, and we could show that we can cover from mid throughput to high throughput on that machine quite efficiently. If you like to scale up even higher, then we are coming to limit which is actually caused by the technology it itself, by this type of pipetting. This is not dependent on the instrument, on the Biomec i7. This is the general limit of technology. So let's assume we can even uh, do a downscaling by factor of four on a system, which is already quite efficient to do this. But in the next step, 
how to imagine if you like to do millions of samples a day a, a year then you can buy a multitude of uh, robots but you're still not reach, reaching the point. The question is, what would be the next step of technology to achieve this? And I think what is really good at that point is uh, ultrasonic driven dispensing and pipetting, because there you can reduce the volumes even more drastically. And you're quite fast in doing this. So this would be a quite neat interfacing between an i7 and an ultra high throughput ultrasonic dispensing. And there you can achieve really then the very high sample throughput numbers. Thank you again, Jürgen and Bjorn. Do you have any final comments for our audience before we go? I'd like to thank you all that you actually joined us. And I'd like to invite you, if you have further question, you can contact me by email. And if you'd like to visit us at ANBL, I'd just like to invite you to. I also say thank you on behalf of Neil and Barlet, and once again, uh, thanking Lab Roots and Beckman Kutter Life Sciences for organizing this webinar. It was a great time uh, with you here and presenting our um, uh, new application uh, with the team. Thank you. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. Any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank Jürgen and Bjorn for their time today and their important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Culture Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.